Hello, it's Pete aka on a retro tip and this episode in my cancelled game series is a bit different as it's not on games at all, it's on consoles. There have been numerous systems over the years that never made it to release, the most well known in recent times being the SNES CD or Nintendo PlayStation. Join me as I take a look at 18 of the many other unreleased consoles. The Sega Neptune was a hybrid Mega Drive and 32X, planned for a late 1995 release. Presumably Neptune was a working title, but we can't be sure, and there are rumours that it would have simply been called the Genesis 32X in North America. Visually it looks like a cross between a Mega Drive 2 and a Saturn. The price point was aimed around $220 with a game in the US and £200 in the UK. The Neptune was essentially Sega's solution to the high price of buying a Mega Drive and a 32X. This is surprising, as Sega had already experienced a disaster with the 32X, and I can't see a hybrid version helping matters. In the end, by the time Sega had got their act together, the Saturn was pretty much ready to go, so the Neptune was scrapped. An unknown number of prototypes have emerged, and one, owned by the Video Game History Museum, is often on show at gaming expos. In the early 80s, home consoles always seemed to include the suffix vision. In television, ColecoVision, but what do you call a system that does it all? UltraVision. The UltraVision video arcade system seemingly came from nowhere, announced by small Miami electronics company UltraVision, who had released a couple of Atari 2600 games. Their new system proper gave it the big one, stating, It's a computer, it's a colour TV, it's an arcade. It combined a 9-inch colour screen with a gaming system, complete with two arcade joysticks and two headphone sockets. This would be the first multimedia home gaming system. Plus, it had a self-charging battery pack, which operated on AC and DC power so it could be plugged into your car's cigarette lighter socket. Because of this, the UltraVision was marketed as portable, although you'd have to be a bodybuilder to lug this beast around, and it wouldn't even fit into the largest of clown's pockets. And I mean a literal clown's pocket, not a vagina. There were to be 12 new games heading to the system, and there were also plans for modules to allow the use of Atari 2600 and ColecoVision games. Ultimately, the UltraVision promised everything and delivered nothing, and it's speculated that the company didn't have the capital to see it through in the first place. The Conix Multisystem started out as a multi-purpose peripheral from British company Conix, codenamed Slipstream, sort of an ultimate version of their joysticks. It was essentially a tabletop controller that could be adapted for different uses, transforming into a steering wheel, motorbike handles or flight controls. It would also feature forced feedback, which was very advanced for the time considering it was conceived in 1988. The project's ambition only swelled from there though, as Conix decided to go one step further by putting a computer inside the controller to make it a fully fledged gaming system. They soon partnered with Flair Technology, who were hardware designers and former Sinclair employees. Flair had a prototype system in the works, which combined a Z80 processor with four custom chips, and promised performance that would rival the 16-bit home computer giants of the time, the Amiga and Atari ST. Flair aimed their computer, the Flair 1, specifically at the home gaming market, and were hoping to release it at only £200, which was about half the cost of the aforementioned Amiga and ST. Once Conix and Flair had joined forces on the project, Flair began the developmental work with assistance from industry legend Jeff Minter. And for the same reason they chose 3.5 inch floppy disks for the system's media. Conix had their hearts set on a 16-bit processor, so the Z80 was abandoned and replaced. The newly named Conix Multisystem appeared at a toy fair in Earl's Court in early 1989, complete with several peripherals including a light gun and a motorised seat called the Power Chair, which would give players an at-home experience similar to the sit-down arcade machines like OutRun. The system's release was announced as August that same year, and several games were said to be in development from leading 16-bit developers such as Psygnosis, Ocean and US Gold. Conix even went as far as promising that the system would have 40 games by Christmas. There were concerns among the press and developers that the system had some issues. 
Firstly, the complexity of the custom chips made it very arduous to program for, and there were worries that the system simply didn't have enough RAM. Eventually, after several delays, Connix simply ran out of money and the project died. Interestingly, the original Flare 1 tech was bought by a video gambling company and was repurposed for use in their quiz machines. Flare went on to develop another system, the inventively named Flare 2, which Atari eventually bought and used as the foundation for the Jaguar. The design of the Conix Multisystem was bought by Chinese company Multisystem China, or MSC, who released it as a controller rather than as a full system under the ridiculously long name MSC Super MS200E Multisystem. The Atari Cosmos was in development by Atari obviously and was a tabletop handheld gaming system. It had two very interesting differences to the other tabletop devices of the time. One, it incorporated holograms to enhance the display. Atari actually bought up the rights to a lot of the holographic tech to make the Cosmos. It worked by using flashing LEDs on screen behind the holographic overlay which would enhance the image, I guess in a similar way to how the Vectrex overlays work and two, it had interchangeable cartridges which was a huge step up from its competition which were all dedicated systems. We all know how big a deal it was when the Game Boy came along and trounced its dedicated handheld competition, so the fact that the Cosmos supported various games was huge. But ah, tricksy little Atari, this was a bit of a white lie. The truth was that the Cosmos was a dedicated system, only it had nine different games built into it rather than one, including Space Invaders and Asteroids. They planned to release the nine games separately, but all the carts actually did was apply the holographic images and a little notch in the cartridge would tell the system which game to load. Very sneaky. Development began in 1978 and was first shown at the New York Toy Fair in 1981. Atari received a lot of criticism on the system, particularly the underwhelming holographic images. Despite this, interest seemed reasonably high, with over 8,000 pre-orders being taken at the show. The Cosmos was obviously very far along, having been shown at the Toy Fair, and Atari even manufactured boxes for the system. For whatever reason, perhaps due to concerns over the criticism the Cosmos had received, it was cancelled altogether later in 1981. In January 2003, Tampa-based Infinium Labs announced that they would soon be releasing the Phantom, a console supporting online delivery software with no physical media. It seems it was an early version of what Steam boxes do now, allowing PC games to be played via download. The price was set just shy of $400, and the Phantom Net subscription, which allowed users to access games and other content, would be $9.95 a month. Release was promised for 2004, but this soon moved to early 2005, then later and later in the year. A prototype Phantom was shown at E3 in 2004, but this was rumoured to be a fake. Infinium needed to raise an estimated $30 million to see the project through, but failed to do so. In 2006, the SEC accused the company's founder of using the Phantom's promotion as a sort of pump and dump scheme and this seemingly wasn't the only financial scandal in which the company had been involved. Ultimately, after the scandals and continual delays, all faith in the project was lost, and the Phantom became, well, a Phantom. The Taito Wow Wow was a planned collaboration between Taito, ASCII and JSB, who owned the Japanese satellite TV network Wow Wow, the namesake of the console first unveiled in 1992 at the Tokyo Game Show. It would use similar hardware to that found in Taito's arcades, meaning that it could receive near-perfect arcade ports. It had a CD-ROM drive and an onboard satellite receiver for downloading games, much like the Super Famicom's Satellaview, which incidentally also connected to the WoWOW network. The first arcade ports would be Darius, Bubble Bobble and Parasol Stars, and promised arcade faithful ports with audio quality equal to the originals. The console was cancelled due to concerns over the data transfer and download speeds being too poor at the time. Nintendo did it three years later in 1995 using almost the same data transfer structure when speeds were marginally better, but it was still a commercial failure, so Taito were probably wise to bow out. The Panasonic M2 was initially designed as an add-on chip for the 3DO, but later evolved into a console. 
3DO developed the technology and planned to license it to several companies, but in the end, exclusive rights were sold to Panasonic. The M2 project was worked on extensively and all parties involved spent a shed load of money on it. Dev kits and prototype consoles were created, which now fetch a pretty penny among collectors of obscure systems. The system was shown at gaming expos in 1995 and five games in development were also shown to the public, Clay Fighter 3, Descent, Iron Blood which was released for the PlayStation as Iron and Blood Warriors of Ravenloft, IMSA Racing and D2, a name which was later used for a different game on the Dreamcast made by the same studio. Both Capcom and Konami were confirmed as licensed developers. The console was absent from E3 the following year and the project soon fizzled out when faced with the established industry veterans that were the PlayStation and N64. Despite the M2 being cancelled in 97, the technology was used in all manner of electronic devices, presumably in an effort to recoup some of the reported $100 million spent on its development. The M2 tech ended up being used in an arcade board from Konami, albeit briefly, in ATMs, vending machines and interactive kiosks. The rare FZ35S interactive media player also incorporated the technology and was used in car dealerships and other sales environments. In 2010 the only completed M2 game was publicly released, 3DO's IMSA Racing. The Atari Game Brain was conceived by Atari as a means of using a stockpile of processors left over from their unsold dedicated consoles. The Game Brain would play 10 different games, all ports of existing dedicated games that Atari had released. These included Stunt Cycle, Video Pinball and numerous variations of Pong. It would have been Atari's first cartridge based console. The console had its controls built into the system itself with each side having a paddle, four directional buttons and a red fire button. Games would be on interchangeable carts inserted in the top of the system. Looking at the inner workings of the game brain reveals that there's not a lot going on inside and in fact it's the game cartridges that do the majority of the work. Atari decided to focus heavily on their upcoming 2600 console and the game brain was dropped sometime in 1978. Three game brain consoles are known to exist today and five prototype carts. The Nano Gear from Nerve Networks was a handheld console aimed at both on the go gamers and budding programmers as it would allow users to create games as well as play them. Users could create their games and share them with other Nano Gear users around the globe. The device would feature USB 2 connectivity, onboard networking and even a Tamagotchi like virtual pet. As you already know, the Nano Gear never appeared, but its spirit lives on in the many games available today that let users create and share their own creations. Ever looked at your flimsy Super Nintendo and thought to yourself, but this isn't heavy enough to kill a man? Well don't worry because Bandai's got you covered. The Bandai HET or Home Entertainment Terminal was an absolute beast and was basically a laptop that played Super Famicom games, complete with a 4 inch screen and TV tuner. It was shown at a show in Tokyo in 93, but details on the system are thin on the ground. I mean I can appreciate the idea, but this thing is bloody massive. Needless to say, Nintendo canned the idea before it went to production, but some working prototypes do exist. Sega clearly had a thing for naming consoles after planets in the 90s with the Saturn and the aforementioned Neptune. Well the Sega Pluto was no exception, bearing in mind Pluto was still classified as a planet at the time. The most likely scenario is that Pluto was just the system's codename during development. The console was essentially a Saturn with a built in modem, with dimensions akin to a Mega Drive 2 and Mega CD2 combo and was a cost effective solution for people wishing to buy a Saturn and get it online. It's not known why it was cancelled but the absolute mess that was the Saturn's launch and marketing had caused the Saturn to be a commercial failure so the Pluto would have just been another hardware loss for Sega. Absolutely nothing was known about the console until 2013 when an ex Sega employee leaked details of the Pluto. The Panasonic Jungle was a handheld system announced in 2010 and I remember it causing quite a stir at the time. It was targeted at people who wanted to play MMOs on the go, 
So given the sheer size of the MMO gaming community, it's no wonder the jungle had a lot of eyes on it. The fact that Panasonic hadn't dipped their toes into the market since 93 with the 3DO was the reason the jungle piqued my interest at the time. The handheld itself had a clamshell design and featured a QWERTY keyboard and a laptop-like touchpad as well as directional pads. It was rumoured to have a 720p OLED screen, featured USB and HDMI interfaces and ran on Linux. Panasonic announced that The Jungle would be released in 2011 with three announced games, Stellar Dawn, RuneScape and Battlestar Galactica Online. In March of 2011, Panasonic announced the system's cancellation, citing changes in the market as their reasoning. The Andrema L600 Entertainment System was a planned open source Linux based console from the newly formed Andrema Entertainment Systems. The L600 was to be all singing and all dancing, being a CD player, games console, DVD player, web browser, MP3 player and would play and record high definition TV. It would have 64 megabytes of RAM and feature a sliding bay via which the owner could replace the graphics card should a newer model be released. Indrama was founded in 99 and an early prototype of the L600 was shown at Linux World in 2000. They closed their doors in 2001 after an unsuccessful fundraising attempt left them $10 million short of bringing the system to market. With a rather odd name that sounds like a female Russian spy, Red Jade was to be Ericsson's handheld Game Boy Advance rival, a statement which is quite frankly laughable. Ha! It was much more than the portable gaming system though, which I don't necessarily think is a good thing, as it had a camera, GPS, could make phone calls, play music, had PDA functions, yada yada, basically everything that you would never want to do on a handheld console. Planned for a 2001 release, the Red Jade promised PlayStation standard graphics and would retail at $150. The developers initially approached Sony and Sega, who both turned down the opportunity to partner on the project, but Ericsson agreed and planned to pump a ton of cash into the project. At the time Ericsson were in a bad way, so they cancelled the handheld before production began in 2001, after having spent a reported $10 million on the Red Jade, fearing further losses, and over 20,000 employees were let go. Miami based Active Enterprises already had a reputation for releasing absolute rubbish, having made the Action 52 cartridge on the NES and Genesis, and the unfinished, unreleased and unbelievably awful Cheetah Men 2. Their next endeavour was to be the Action Game Master, a handheld device with a 3.2 inch screen which could play NES, Super Nintendo, Mega Drive and CD games, which would be achieved via adapters which could be bought separately. I've no idea how they thought this would work because the concept sounds ridiculously expensive and there would have been numerous legal issues surrounding the Nintendo and Sega adapters. The Action Gamester doesn't seem to have progressed past the conceptual stages as no prototypes have ever surfaced and Active Enterprises went bust in 1994. Virtual reality is the hot thing in gaming right now, but prior to this there were several failed attempts at getting the technology to market. The Sega VR is one such device. Sega actually planned a few iterations of the Sega VR, one for arcades and one for home consoles, first for the Mega Drive and then for the Saturn. The headset worked in a similar way to those of today, having LCD screens in the visor, stereo headphones and motion sensors that could track the player's head movements. The Sega VR was announced in 1991 with a scheduled 94 release date and would retail at $200. It was shown at 93 CES. Five games were initially planned for the system, Outlaw Racing, Nuclear Rush and Iron Hammer, all games in which the player drives or pilots a vehicle of some sort, a port of Virtua Racing, and perhaps most interestingly, Matrix Runner, a cyberpunk adventure game that was inspired by Snatcher. The technology was used in arcades, but the home versions were cancelled, with Sega claiming that prolonged use of the prototype headsets had induced motion sickness in users, and that the virtual reality was quote, too real, leading to fears that players would injure themselves. 
The Atari Panther was born from the technology designed by Flair Technology, the ex Sinclair team that we covered earlier with the Conix Multi System. The Panther was a 32 bit system which began its development in 1988 and had a planned 91 release. Three games were known to be in development Cybermorph, Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy, and Raiden, which were all reworked for the Jaguar after the Panther was scrapped. It was abandoned in favour of the Jaguar, which Atari considered to be their best bet. Three Panther prototypes are known to exist today. The Hasbro Control Vision was a console that used VHS tapes rather than cartridges and was being developed by Tom Zito, known for creating several FMV games, particularly on the Sega Mega CD, including Night Trap, Sewer Shark and Double Switch. Codenamed Nemo, it began its development in 1985. A prototype was made by modifying a ColecoVision and toy company Hasbro invested $7 million in the project in exchange for exclusive rights to the technology. By 1986 they had three short test games running, an interactive music video, a baseball game and an interactive mystery called Scene of the Crime which was the basis for Night Trap. The only known footage of the games is this terrible quality clip of a test screening of Scene of the Crime. After this, development began on Night Trap and Sewer Shark, but prior to the Control Vision's 1989 release, Hasbro cancelled the system, amid fears that its price point of $299 couldn't compete with the Nintendo's NES, which by 1989 was already a success and was far more affordable. After having spent an entire month filming Sewer Shark in 1987 and a reported $3 million, Zeta had put a lot of work into the game. After the console's cancellation he bought the rights to the games and they sat dormant until the early 90s when CD-ROM technology became affordable and CD-based consoles began to emerge, in particular the Mega CD. Zito teamed up with Sega and brought Night Trap and Sewer Shark to the Mega CD, followed by several other FMV games. So in a way, the failed control vision gave birth to this entire genre of games. So that was a quick look at 18 of the many consoles that never were. Let me know which of them you think showed promise and those best left on the scrap heap. And as always, thanks for watching. You can find the rest of the episodes in my cancelled game series by clicking on this playlist.